Amen. So we're here in Hosea chapter number 7, and if you remember last week, we looked at verse number 9 in detail. We looked at utilizing your time. We looked at these people. So God is, you know, passing um, judgment down on Israel or warning Israel about the judgment to come through the prophet Hosea. He's talking about um, this is during the northern kingdom of Israel, um, during the reign of Jeroboam. And in verse number 9, we looked at how they had gray hair here and there upon him, but ye knoweth, ye, yet he knoweth not. So they were old and they had years behind them and they had wasted all their time and they learned nothing or they didn't have any wisdom. So we looked at utilizing your time last week. This evening, we're going to look at verses number 10 through verse number 13. So look down at Hosea chapter number 7 and look at verse number 10. We're going to go down to verse number 13. And we're going to look at what um, God is, is talking about is uh, the problem in these verses. But look at verse number 10. The Bible says, And the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. And they do not return to the Lord their God, nor do they seek him for all this. So God calls out pride there in verse number 10. Keep that in mind. We'll go down to verse number 11. It says Ephraim. Also, again, Ephraim is just kind of like a, um, it's the largest tribe, just kind of a, a synonym that God is using for the nation. Ephraim is also like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. So notice the heart part there. Look at verse number 12. When they shall go, I shall spread my net upon them. I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe unto them, verse 13, for they have fled from me, destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them. So we're talking about saved people here, okay? I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. So look at verse number 10 here. We see pride... Um, is the problem that's called out, and notice that they have a heart problem in verse number 11. But the part I want to focus on is in verse number 10, where the Bible says that the pride of Israel testifieth to his face. What does that mean? All right, and that's what I want to focus on as an introduction this morning, so, or this evening. First of all, we need to understand pride is the problem, but the Bible is saying pride, it testifies to his face. It's saying that the pride of Israel is testifying against itself. The pride is testifying against the nation. So it's like if I would talk to an individual and you know, reword this, I could say, your pride is testifying against you, is how I would rephrase that. Pride testifies to your face. So first of all, turn to Ezekiel chapter, 30, uh, Ezekiel chapter number 36. What is pride, first of all? Because this is the pride of this nation in these three verses that are leading them to destruction, four verses, sorry. But it says the pride testifies to their face, all right? So look at Ezekiel chapter number 36, if you would. Let's look at what pride is, what pride is. Because the Bible gives a very specific uh, definition of what pride is, and it's one that we should remember ourselves, all right? Because the answer to pride and the answer to making sure that we don't get prideful and we don't fall into individual destruction because look all these lessons uh, uh, you know upon this nation here from Hosea can be applied to ourselves individually they can be applied to our family they can be applied to our church they can be applied individually all right look at verse number 28 of Ezekiel chapter number 36 Ezekiel chapter so Ezekiel is a contemporary of Daniel this is talking about Judah and the you know the captivity of Babylon there's end times um, there's end times uh, prophecy here as well, but we're just going to look at the immediate um, meaning of these verses. And in verse number 28, it says, And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Talking about the restoration of Israel um, after the captivity. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree. This is talking about like after they've gotten right, after the 70 years, they're going to go back. All right, and the increase of the field that you shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. All right, they've been in captivity. Look at verse 31. Then you shall remember your own evil ways. So he's saying you're going to go back and you're going to get right. And you're not just going to get right and forget, you know, everything that happened. He said, you're going to remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. And look at this. Look at this. This is kind of the opposite of what we see 
in Hosea chapter number 7. So if you write it in your Bible, you could just say Hosea 7.10, opposite right here, okay? And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. So just like, you know, the pride of Israel testifies to his face, it says ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. So this is the opposite of having pride here. They're looking back at what they did, at well, how they, you know, how they betrayed God and then they went into Babylonian captivity for 70 years, and they're loathing themselves. Instead of, you know, having pride testify to you and tell you how great you are, these people are looking at what they did and they're like, that's disgusting. I can't believe we did that. We don't want to go back there. All right? For your iniquities and for your abominations. Turn to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter number 21. Proverbs chapter number 21. Proverbs chapter number 21. So we're looking at what is pride? What's the definition of pride? All right? And we see that the pride of Israel testifies to his own face in Hosea chapter 7, verse number 10. Then we see how they loathe themselves. That's the opposite of pride. They loathe themselves. So they're looking at themselves in Hosea 7. They're looking at themselves in a good way. They think they're great. And in, Hosea, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, they're loathing themselves. They're looking at themselves and they're disgusted with themselves. So you understand that pride has to do with how we see ourselves. That is how you can recognize pride. Look at Proverbs 21 and verse number 2. Proverbs 21 and verse number 2. And this is another perfect match for Hosea chapter 7, verse number 10, and verse number 11, because in verse number 10, it talks about how they have pride, and that testifies to themselves. You see, the pride is it's, it's telling them they're great, is what it's saying. The pride is telling themselves that they're wonderful. And the problem in verse number 11 is that God looks at the heart, see? But look at Proverbs 21, verse number 2. Every way of a man is right when, what? In his own eyes. But, now here's the opposite, right? Here's the, the flip side of the coin that we see in Proverbs. But the Lord pondereth the what? The hearts. So you know what the Bible is saying in Hosea chapter 7, verse number 10, verse number 11, explaining to us in Ezekiel chapter 28, and then again, like this is exactly what Hosea 7, 10, and 11 said, Proverbs 21, verse number 2. It's saying the problem with pride is this. You look at yourself, and in your own eyes you're great, but God looks at your heart, and your heart's not great. That's the problem with pride. So pride is literally looking at yourself, thinking that you are great, when your heart is rotten. And God, unfortunately, God doesn't look at us with our own eyes. God looks at our heart. So the problem is this. Pride versus humility is literally defined by, I mean, just take Hosea chapter 7 and Ezekiel chapter number 36, verse number 28, Pride versus, that's pride versus humility right there. It is literally defined by how you see yourself. Whether you loathe yourself or whether you think that you're great. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 15. Let me give you some more examples of this. Samuel actually references the moment that Saul hid when he takes the kingdom from him. Paul, uh, Saul, I mean, Samuel, uh, he references this exact thing when he talks to Saul about losing the kingdom. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 15. So, of course, Saul goes and he does this great thing and he, you know, slays the Amalekites. He had already kind of messed up uh, before with, you know, sacrificing on his own. But look at verse uh, 17 of Samuel chapter number 15. Samuel rebukes him because he just, he's disobeying God. He's making sacrifices on his own. He's, you know, not following what God tells him to do when he goes to war, and he's just blaming other people. He's not taking responsibility for the things that he's doing and the rebellion that he has. Look at verse number 17. It says, And Samuel said, look what he says and how he puts it to Saul. He says, When thou wast little in what? In thine own sight. Was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? I mean, look. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter number 13. You would have thought that he would have been more obedient because he was already on thin ice in verse number 15 or in chapter number 15. Because he'd already kind of dis, you know, he'd already sacrificed on his own in chapter number 13. Look at verse number 8. 
verse number 8 of 1 Samuel chapter number 13. But notice how Samuel puts it to Saul. He says, when you were little in your own sight. So it depends. You know, what he was saying is you were, you were humble. You had humility. He's not little in his own sight anymore. He's big in his own sight. Look at verse number 8. It says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. Of course, this is Samuel's job. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of the offering, of the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore I said, The Philistines will come down now, now, down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have made, not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, verse 13, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. So it was really chapter 13 where he kind of lost the kingdom. And then he kind of just solidified that in, in chapter 15 when it came to, you know, not finishing off the, the Amalekites. But now the kingdom, thy kingdom shall not continue. Verse 14. The Lord hath sought him. Now look at this. Now remember, what does the Lord look at? The Lord doesn't look at how you see yourself. The Lord looks at the heart. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. The Lord was looking for someone to establish the everlasting line to the throne of Christ, and Saul messed it up. His pride cost him his job, is what happened here. I mean, when you're thinking about the differences between David and Saul, and you wonder why God, you know, why did God love David so much? The, the reason, I mean, it wasn't their sins. Because David committed some terrible sins in his life. David was far from perfect. The answer is, David was humble. And he was at least, I mean, he was at least able to be humbled by someone that came to tell him the truth. I mean, even after his child was killed, the, after his punishment of his sins of murder and adultery, David never charges God. He never charges God. He just accepts it. And he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation, of thy salvation. He accepts it, and he moves on. I mean, Saul, see, the difference is Saul never thought he deserved the punishment of God. That's the difference between David and Saul. It's not that one was a more bloody man. I mean, they were both men of war. They were both, you know, I mean, David went crazy, you know, in certain battles and went way over the top in certain battles. And, you know, it's just David was humble. Thus God, you know, and Saul never, never thought, he never humbled himself throughout the rest of his life. He never thought that he deserved the punishment of God. And thus God did not have mercy on him because of that. And that ended the reign of Saul and his family. Uh, you know, plain and simple. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 26. So we see what pride is. Let's look at what the results of pride are. What the results of pride are. Look at Proverbs chapter number 26. Let me show you what the results of pride are and show you that, like, if someone is going to be prideful and not going to, you know, stop being prideful, there's no hope for the prideful. Look at verse number 12 of Proverbs chapter number 26. Proverbs chapter 26, look at verse number 12. Let's look at the results of pride. The results of pride. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. You see, once you have become prideful, if you do not get rid of that problem, the Bible is saying that there's fading hope for you. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 20. 1 Samuel chapter number 20. See, it causes, it causes complete blindness. You will even, in 1 Samuel chapter number 20, we'll see this, but pride as it sets in and it grows and it grows and it grows, you will even refuse counsel. You will even not even allow someone to come to you and say, you know, you should change this, you should fix this. Even when people tried 
to tell you. Saul's own son tried to give him counsel. Look at 1 Samuel chapter number 20. 1 Samuel chapter number 20. Look at verse number 25. 1 Samuel chapter number 20 and verse number 25. So, of course, Saul was envious and he was upset at David because David, you know, he was just very insecure. And, but Jonathan and David were good friends. Jonathan and David were good friends, Jonathan being Saul's son. And Jonathan tries to advocate for David. Look at verse number 25. It says, And the king sat upon his seat. I mean, David, I mean, at this point, Saul is trying to kill David, as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side, and David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day, for he thought, Something hath befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. So he just said, well, you know, something must have happened. You know, he's not ready for dinner. He, you know, we'll just let this go this one time. But it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. So again, he's not there. And Saul said unto Jonathan, his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. So he gives kind of, the, he gives this lame excuse of why David, he's covering for David, okay? And he said, let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city. This is the excuse. And my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me go away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. So right away, Saul understands that Jonathan is covering for David here. And Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse and rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness. So he just like insults his own son here and just says, you know, you're siding with him over me and just like <laughs> insults his mother. And he says, for as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. He's like, why are you even friends with him? Because he's a threat to you being the king. Because Saul knew that David was the anointed one that was going to take over the throne. He's like, why are you even being nice to somebody that's going to take your spot, is what Saul is basically trying to explain to him. He says, wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul his father. So here's the advice. Here's the advice that he tries to give to his father. And said unto him, wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? So his own son says to him, Hey, you're not doing the right thing. This is an innocent guy. This man has done nothing. It doesn't matter that, you know, he is a threat to some position that you think that I should have in your own eyes. He's saying, you're not doing the right thing. Jonathan is doing a great service to his father right here. Jonathan is the real friend of his father right here. Jonathan is the one that truly loves his father right here. And what is he rewarded with? Look at verse number 33. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So he tries to kill his own son after his son tries to give him godly advice. Now let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. How many people do you think tried to give Saul godly counsel after this point? Let me tell you what the answer to that is. Zero. Because he, if anybody could get away with giving godly counsel to the king, it would be his own son. But he tried to kill him for it. So you think like the, 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 the court gesture or whatever is going to try to do it? I don't think so. You think his, his wise men or his counselors are even going to try to do it? No, they're going to be like, no, you tried to kill his own son. We're just going to go along to get along. Look, this is... This is a powerful application for, you know, business right here, too. If you act this way in your life, act this way in your family, look, you could run your family this way. You could run your family this way. Look, I could be this dictator in my house that just, it's just my way or the highway, and I never talk to my wife about anything. Look, I, people do that. People run their family that way. But you know what? I like the counsel of my wife. Of my wife, everyone's like, "Well, you know, your wife." No, my wife does not rule my house, but it is nice to have the counsel of somebody else. My wife, my son—I mean, all of these different things. It's nice to 
get other people's opinions on things. I mean, at work, it's the same way. If you run, if you're a, any kind of leader or manager in the workplace, and you run this way where somebody brings up anything other than what you want to do, and then you just dress them down and bark at them and just have an over-the-top negative reaction at them, pretty soon, you're going to have no one that is going to say a thing to you. Let me tell you something. That's not a good place to be in life. There is no safety there. There's safety in the multitude of counselors. And look, ultimately, this downward spiral of Saul, it cost him his life. And the life of Jonathan, too, sadly. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 16. So, I mean, prideful people don't just take themselves down. You know, they take other people down with them. Proverbs chapter number 16, look at verse number 18. Proverbs 16, verse number 18. Actually, I'll read that to you. Go to James chapter 4. Go to James chapter 4. We've all heard Proverbs 16, 18 before. The Bible says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. So that's exactly what we see in the four verses that we looked at in Hosea chapter 7. We saw that pride in verse number 10, and in verse number 13, I believe it was. What did we see came from that? What's coming after that is destruction because of your pride. So now let's look at what pride will cause you. Let's look at the sentence of pride. What the sentence of pride. So we now know what pride is. We now know, you know what it means to be prideful. But let's look at what pride will cost you. Let's look at the sentence of pride. Look at James chapter 4. Look at verse number 6. It says, But he giveth more grace, talking about God, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 23. So the first thing is, pride will literally cause God to oppose you. I mean, pride, a prideful person, a prideful nation, will cause God to resist, to oppose you, to be against you. Look at Isaiah chapter number 23. Isaiah chapter number 23. Look at verse number 9. Isaiah 23, 9. The Bible says, The Lord of hosts has, hath purposed it, to stain the pride of all glory, and to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. It's saying God is going to contempt all the people that see themselves. He's, he's talking about people that see themselves as honorable, people that are prideful. Isaiah chapter number 2, just flip back a few chapters. Flip back a few chapters. So we're seeing that God will resist the proud. God will resist the proud. Look at Isaiah chapter number 2. Look at verse number 12. Isaiah chapter number 2 and verse number 12, the Bible says, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Talking about, you know, the judgment of the Lord here being upon the proud. All right? It's basically saying in all these verses and many other verses in the Bible that God will bring down the prideful. I don't know about you, but I need the Lord on my side in my life. Look, I want the Lord on my side in my life. Go to Proverbs chapter number 13. The next thing pride will do, the next sentence of pride, and this is really maybe the scariest part of pride. The scariest part of pride. So again, pride is how you see yourself. Pride versus humility has to do with how you see yourself. If you're prideful, you see yourself in a great light when your heart is not great because God's looking at the heart. Now, the scariest thing about pride is that pride will blind you. You're like, what are you talking about? I mean, I see myself as great, but pride will blur your vision. This is the problem. Look at Proverbs 13.10. Proverbs 13.10. Saul, just remember, Saul, with his own son, he would heed no advice. Proverbs 13.10, the Bible says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So pride, though, will cause you to not take any advice. So you should take good advice. Look, especially if you're in charge. You're like, I'm in charge. I don't have to take anybody's advice. See, this is a problem people make. They get in leadership positions where you know, they don't have to take anyone's advice, and then they don't. And then they're horrible at, you know, being a leader. That's the problem. But 
A leader, I mean, I've said this many times, a leader who refuses to listen, this was Saul, will soon be surrounded by people that have nothing to say. That's exactly what happened to Saul. Look, and trust me, Proverbs 29, Proverbs 29, verse number 5. What does it say? Flattering lips, you know, a man with flattering lips spreadeth a net for your feet. Here's the problem. If someone gets prideful and they're blinded by it, they don't see it, there are plenty of yes men. There are plenty of yes There's not that many Jonathans that are going to stand right next to Saul when he's got a javelin on the wall behind him or whatever, knowing you know, who that man is and are going to give him that advice that he doesn't want to hear. There's not that many. But you know what? There's a lot of yes men. So leaders beware. You get that leadership job, you get that leadership position, whatever it is, just you need to remember that there's always plenty of those everywhere. People that will just agree with everything that you have to say, no matter what you say. And look, they, the, the problem with you, you're like, what's the problem with that? I don't want any conflict. I want to go to work and I want to just, you know, I want to just do what I want to do. And I want to do things the way I want to do them. And I don't want anybody opposing me, giving me any other ideas, telling me. The problem with yes men is that they will not warn you of destruction. As a matter of fact, many times they will push you into it. Many times it's the yes men who are going to let you make your own decisions because maybe they want the position that you're in. Maybe they're like, hey, why don't you go this way? And there's like a big hole over there. And they want you to fall in it. There are plenty of those people out there. And they're going to be like, you're the greatest, and you're awesome, and everything that you do is right. Look, a prideful man does not need to be told what he wants to hear. And there are plenty of, the problem is, is that he will be blinded, and there are plenty of people that will tell him exactly what he wants to hear. That's the issue. I mean, pr I mean it's like... Uh, it's, it's like a child, play, you know, playing with a loaded gun or something. And the yes men are, like, giving, giving them bullets and telling them to, like, wave it around. I mean, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's not something. It's you're just doing, the, you know, you get yourself to that point in your life, and you're in trouble because there's plenty of these people that are always going to be around you. And we have to remember that. I mean, your own pride can turn into a, a train of destruction that has no brakes. That's what the Bible is teaching us here. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 24. And look, Proverbs, uh, pride, go to Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter number 24. Look, pride is extra dangerous for young people. We can all get prideful, but pride is extra dangerous for young people. I mean, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the Bible warns young people, flee youthful lusts. The problem with being young is you start to figure some things out and then you overcorrect. You start to get some things right in your life. Maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you get into your 20s. You start to figure things out. You get a job. You start, you know, maybe you get married. You figure, you're like, hey, I got it all figured out. I'm great. But the problem with that is, you know, young people, and look, I did this myself in my 20s. The mo I mean, I can tell you right now, I mean, let me just confess my faults to you all. The most prideful point in my life was probably when I was about, I don't know, 26, 27 years old probably. That was probably my peak of pride right there. Because you're starting, to, you're starting to figure some stuff out. You're starting to get good at some things. You're starting to get some things together. And then you overcorrect. And you think, like, I know everything. That's the danger for young people. So they should always remind themselves of that. Look at Proverbs 24, 6. Again, what does the Bible say here? It says, for by wise counsel thou shalt make war. And in a multitude of counselors there is safety. I mean, back to that family. I mean, I always... You know, I bounce a lot of things off my wife. And I always wanted a marriage like that. I always wanted a marriage where I married someone who was intelligent, that was able to, you know, think. And, you know, I mean, why? Because, like, it keeps us all safe. I mean, sometimes, you know, I like to just bounce things around and we talk about things. And sometimes there's many aspects that maybe I miss a variable. Or I'm looking at something from maybe more of a, you know, I tend to look at things from a more you know, black and white perspective. And I don't consider, you know, people's feelings as much as I should sometimes. I mean, that's just what I know about myself. 
And it's nice to have, you know, some counsel there. And look, there's, there's many times or there's times when I take that advice and I know that, okay, yeah, we just have to do it this way though because of other variables and things that I know that maybe she's not aware of. But the point is, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. You know, I mean, if you just want, you know, uh, to, to marry someone who's just, you know, just be quiet and don't ever say anything, you know, you're leaving something on the table there is what I'm trying to get you to see. All right? In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. But a prideful person will not want any counsel from anybody. And that is the, the spiral of destruction that can destroy a prideful person. Again, pride goeth before destruction. So somebody that's destroyed, the pride was there. The pride was there when the train came off the tracks. That's what the Bible is telling us. I brought this up a few years ago, but there was a, I mean, pride is basically, pride is basically a perfect storm when you think about it. And I brought this storm up that happened in 1991 and, and this ship was lost. And this storm was like these three massive systems that moved together. And look, I watch this, uh, the Marine app all the time on my phone just to make sure that, you know, before I go out on the ocean, that, that you know, I mean, you, don't, you can't not do that and go out fishing on the ocean. But the worst I've ever seen it in California is when we had those massive, you know, uh, atmospheric rivers coming in, like a year, you know, two years ago. And I saw like Port San Luis had the, the jetty was just overflowed and it just like, it came over the rocks and it came into the, into the uh, campground and everything. But the worst I've ever seen it about three, four miles out on this app was about 20 to 25 foot seas. But in this storm in 1991, off the, uh, off the East Coast, there was 100 foot waves in the Atlantic Ocean. And it was just this perfect situation where these, all these storms came in and they fed each other and it just tore up the ocean. And there happened to be uh, a ship out there, a couple ships actually, and you know, the crew was never found. But the, the point I'm trying to get at here is like pride can turn into a perfect storm in your life. And the reason is, is because maybe, you know, you do some things right and you have some success in your life. And then you get lifted up. In what? In your own eyes. You get lifted up in your own eyes because you look at your success and you say, well, I am, look at these great things. I'm great. And you get lifted up in your own eyes you don't notice that you got lifted up. You just notice the great things. This is this perfect storm that I'm talking about it. And then you become blinded. You become blinded so you can't see that you're lifted up. Maybe God sends counsel to you. Maybe God sends counsel to you to tell you you're lifted up. David didn't do anything. He's innocent. You should not be doing this. But you're already blinded. So you take that counsel that God sent to you. Maybe that counsel is your friend. You know, the Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. Look, the yes man is not a friend. The person that's going to tell you you're right all the time, that is not your friend. The friend is going to wound you. But then you pick up the javelin and you throw it at the actual friend. And then at that point... You forsake the counsel. At that point, you get even more prideful. And this storm and this cycle just repeats and it repeats and then you lose the counsel because no one's going to step in front of the javelin anymore. And you just have all these, these little people like, you're the best, you're great. All these little, I mean, they just want to hurt you. And eventually, God himself turns against you. The mercy, look, there's mercy, there's long-suffering, all of that. But eventually, God starts to resist the proud. And look, if God is against you, you're done. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how hard you work. I don't care, like, have you ever had those times in your life where it just seems like just nothing works? where you're working so hard and you're doing everything and you're just going and you're just going and you're doing, make, you're doing all the right moves, but it's just the wheels are just spinning and digging in. 
Maybe you should think about how you see yourself in those situations. Because look, it doesn't matter. If God is against you, it doesn't matter how good you are, how hard you work, the, all the right moves you're making, anything like that. If God is against you, you have no chance in this life. None. So how do you stay humble? How do we avoid going into this, this death spiral? That's the last thing I want to point out to you tonight. Turn to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. How do you stay humble? Remember, it's the sight. It's the sight. It's your sight that matters. Pride is you seeing yourself in a great way. I look at myself and I say, I am so great. Look at me. I'm not as this man. You look at yourself and you see something great, but your heart is rotten. And God sees the heart. God doesn't look at you and see what you see. James chapter 4, the Bible says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. That's the opposite of God resisting you, God destroying you, you going into destruction. Look at James chapter number 1. So I'm going to give you two steps tonight as we end. I'll just give you two simple steps on how to stop yourself from entering into this train wreck of pride in your life. Look at James chapter number one. You say, I am great. Is it wrong that I am awesome at everything that I do? Look, I am glad that you are good at everything you do. And every single man, woman, and child in this church, I think that you should try to perfect kids. You should try to do as good as you can in school. You should work hard, you should study hard, you should take every single subject seriously. When your mom teaches you, you don't be like, oh, you know, it's just my mom, so I don't really have to do this. No, because you're going to be a dummy when you grow up if you do that. But here's what's going to happen if you take school seriously. If you take everything that your mom gives you, all the worksheets, and you read all the books, and you just keep reading and reading and reading, guess what? You're going to be smart. And you're gonna, if you read and read and read and read, you're going to be smarter than most people you meet by the time you're 20, if you read a lot. That's where we're at today, folks. But don't be like, I'm the best. I'm so good. I'm so smart. All these other people, I mean, they're not like me. Look, you can't, I mean, you should, be, you should get awesome at everything that you do. Homeschool moms should try to be the best teachers that they can. They should try, stick to every detail. Not be like, oh, this subject's hard, you know, and I, I don't really want to deal with this. No, they should, they should be detailed. They should be sitting down and reading the Bible and going through the Bible verse by verse by verse with their children, even though it will take probably over a year to go through the Bible. You know, with your children, maybe two years to go through the whole Bible with one of your small children. But don't skip the details. They should be detailed and detailed and detailed. But then you'll find that your kids are going to actually learn the Bible and know the Bible, and you could get lifted up and be like, I am the greatest teacher ever. Anybody can get lifted up because we're supposed to be good at what we do. We're supposed to try and be diligent in our business. We're supposed to do this. Look down at James chapter number one. So how do I stay humble? How do I be so awesome and stay humble? Look at verse number 17. Here's how you do it. I'm going to give you two steps. The first one is this. You realize verse number 17. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That's the first way right there. You realize that everything comes from the Lord. Everything. Every idea you've ever had you work hard, or you say, well, I worked hard. I worked hard to, you know, I, I knew a guy like that. He worked really hard. And he always said that, you know what, God doesn't put food on my table. I remember I was a kid, I heard him say that. One of the hardest working people I've ever met. I grew up around a lot of hard working men. And he worked really hard and he said, you know what, you know, God doesn't put food on my table. And he went to church and he believed in God, but he's like, I work, no, 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 no. It's, God that gave you that ability to get up every day. It's God that gave you the health to be able to go out and work hard every day. That can go away just like that. You could have, a, you could have some kind of stroke and your mind could be gone tomorrow. You could lose the ability to think. You could lose the ability to do anything 
tomorrow. If you have the ability to go out and be diligent, God gave you that ability every single day, every single hour of your life. So that's the first thing. You say, everything good comes from the Lord. So if you have good results, that came from the Lord. Every soul saved came from the Lord, not you. Every soul saved came from the gospel. You say, well, you know, I go out and I go soul winning and I, I get these many people saved and all this and I'm really diligent about it. Great, but praise God for that. Because every good thing comes from the Lord. You say, I'm so good at my job. Look, every idea you've ever had came from the Lord. If it's good, it came from God. And guess what? He can take it just as easy, easily as he gave it. So that's the first thing. Just realize that everything, it doesn't come from you. Look, turn to Matthew chapter 6. God only promises you one, you know, two things, really. I mean, so you say, like, I have all this extra stuff because I work hard and I go soul winning and I'm so spiritual and all this. But look, God, I mean, God can take it just as, as well as he, he gave it to you. If you get lifted up in pride. Look at Matthew chapter number 6. Look at verse number 31. The Bible says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? And what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You're really only guaranteed food and clothing from the Lord, is what the Bible is saying here. Everything else, you just need to realize that you need to thank God for all of those blessings and all of those gifts. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Well, actually, I'll just read it for you. It says, In having food and raiment, let us therefore be content. Anything else is extra. It's a blessing from the Lord, not you, from the Lord being the point. It's all about the proper perspective in our lives. We're supposed to work hard, be diligent, be good at things, but... Thank God for it. Wow, I got a promotion. Like, you guys get promotions. I got a promotion. Wow, thank God. God will bless your efforts. It's God that lifteth up. Thank God for all those things. I mean, it's all about the proper perspective to stay humble. You say, well, you know, everybody else leaves early. I'm the best employee here. Everybody else is a loser. I mean, look, it doesn't take hard, it doesn't take a lot to, you know, outperform a lot of people today. But that shouldn't lift us up, because that's what we're supposed to do as Christians. I mean, just do the right thing and then thank God for your job. Thank God that, you know, he gave you this direction that we should work for every employer like we're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God. I mean, that's, that's great perspective right there. How about this one? My kids are great. I'm the best parent in the world. I am awesome. Look, or how about this? How, how about this perspective? I mean, because have you ever heard, oh, well, my, my baby's the smartest, whatever, you know? I mean, I mean, just like all, you know, the baby comparisons or whatever. I'm the best and all this, you know, just leave. How, how about this? How about this? Praise God my kids are turning out. Praise God that the promises in the Bible that God told me are true. How about that perspective? Praise God that God said, you know, do it this way and, you know, raise up a child and the way she'll go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Praise God for that. Instead of, I'm the best parent ever and getting all, you know, lifted up. It's all about perspective. That's it. Turn to Luke chapter number 14. When you start to get lifted up, you need to immediately fix your perspective before it turns into this pride snowball, you know, going down this hill, this hill of destruction that can't be stopped. But here's another safety. So that's the first one. That's the first one. Keep the proper perspective knowing that everything good comes from God. That's number one. Number two is this. Look at Luke chapter number 14. Luke chapter number 14. And I like this one because this one's just... This is just really mechanical, and you can just do this one all the time, all right? Look at verse number 7. It said, He put forth a parable to those which were bidden, and when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying to them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee come in and say to thee, Give this man place, 
and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. This is kind of like a, I mean, we just think of just the actual situation here. This is just really good advice. You know, don't go into a wedding and sit at the head table. Don't go into a wedding and sit at the front table. He's like, no, no, no. You go sit, no matter who you are, go sit in the very back. Because that way, you're, the only choice is that you're going to be lifted up. You're not going to have to go through this embarrassing thing where people come up to you and they're like, uh, why, why are you sitting there? Like, this is the groom's seat or whatever. And you're like, oh, you know. I mean, we used to do this <laughs> at, at, at baseball games. I mean, we used to go to a lot of Rangers games, like when uh, Garrett was a kid. And I only did this a couple times, okay? But you know you got these, you got horrible seats and you're like way up there. And you're like, it's like the fourth inning. And you see like there's some really good seats right off of first base. And no one's been sitting there. And you're like, hey, let's just go sit down there. And you go down and sit down there with your buddy or whatever. And, and all of a sudden, like the, you know, the, the attendant like, comes up to you and he's like, um, can I see your ticket, sir? And you're all like, uh. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Then you got to get up and you got to go way back up to the nosebleed section. But that's kind of what this is, is talking about. So it's best to sit in the back. And then somebody else can move you up. So the second point is this, regardless of your sight, regardless of how you see yourself, take the lowest seat. Even if you think to yourself, you go to the wedding and you're like, I am clearly the most awesome person at this wedding. Even if you think that, sit in the back. Just do that as you know, mechanics. Do it for safety. Do it for safety. Look, literally and figuratively. Of course, that's what the Bible is talking about here. Look, do this with your family. Do this with your family. Do this as you lead your family. Uh, you know, I run the budget in my house. But I should look at the budget in my house, and I should make sure that my wife and my children have everything that they need before I just go out and buy myself something. You take the lowest seat. That's how you lead. That's how you lead, and that's how you stop yourself from being a prideful leader. You should do it in the church. You should do it in the church. You should be, when you're talking with people, you know, I mean, you should remind yourself when you're talking to people and you're, we're fellowshipping in church, you should remind yourself to, like, take the lowest seat. How was your week? How was your job? How was that interview that you had last Monday or that you were talking about earlier? You should think. Take the lowest seat. You should not just come in and just take up all the seats and just tell everybody everything that you want to say and everything that you care about. You should take the lowest seat and give other people that seat that's in front. All right? Look, regardless of your sight, regardless of, th that's why this is such a good protective measure here in Luke chapter number 14, because regardless of how you see yourself, and maybe it's kind of a good test for you because if you force yourself, to take that lowest seat, and you find yourself being like, oh, I really shouldn't have to sit here. You're getting prideful. That's a warning for yourself. It's a, it's a red flag. It's, a, you know, it's an alarm that can go off and say, hey, maybe, maybe my sight needs a little bit of adjustment here. So the two protections against pride that I leave you with tonight are, number one, just remember that no matter how good you get at something, no matter what kind of successes that you have. Look, if you have success with your family, it, is, it literally has nothing to do with you. If you have success with your family, it's because you listened to what God said. It's because you did it this way. And then, just as a matter of practice, just take the lowest seat, no matter what your sight is telling you. Because pride is a problem with how you see yourself and once that starts to you know, diverge from where your heart is, that's where trouble sets in. And that's where this snowball effect of pride leads to literal destruction. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.